Hello and welcome to Vandenberg Space Force Base on the central coast of California for the science briefing of the International Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, also known as SWAT. I'm Jasmine Hopkins with NASA Communications. SWAT will be the first satellite mission to observe nearly all the water on Earth's surface. This will help scientists understand how water moves worldwide and give us new insight into climate change. SWAT is an international collaboration between NASA and the French space agency CNES, with contributions from the UK and Canadian space agencies as well. This mission will lift off aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket this Thursday, that's December 15th, at 3.46 a.m. Pacific. And this will mark the 101st mission managed by NASA's Launch Services Program based at Kennedy Space Center. Joining us today is a distinguished panel of guests ready to uncover the science behind SWAT. Starting on my left, we have Kate Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA, Selma Churchali, Earth Observation Program Manager from CNES, Nadia Vinogradova Schiffer, SWAT Program Scientist for NASA, Tamlin Pavelski, SWAT Hydrology Science Lead from the University of North Carolina. And finally, Benjamin Hamlington, research scientist for the Sea Level and Ice Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are so glad to have this panel of experts with us today, and they'll be answering questions from media here in the room and over the phone. We also invite the public to join the conversation online using hashtag AskNASA. But before we get into your questions, we're going to give each of them a moment to introduce themselves and their role in the mission. And uh, Kate, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. NASA has a long history of studying our home planet. Um, so if you cue my first animation, this is going to show you the current Earth observing fleet. We have more than two dozen Earth observing satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station. We have more than 60 years of satellite observations. Many of those observations and satellite missions are in partnership with other U.S. government agencies or international partners, like SWAT, which is in partnership with CNES, the French Space Agency, with contributions from the U.K. and Canadian space agencies. And SWAT is continuing our legacy of partnership. When we're looking at Earth from space, we've been observing the Earth for decades. We can see both the state of it now as well as how it's changed over time. And we're thinking about where NASA is going forward in Earth science. It's continuing to innovate and do new observations, as well as to work on providing that information to the public um, as stakeholders and users to ensure that they have actionable information as they're going forward. And SWAT is a part of both of that. Uh, SWAT is, a, is a, one of the missions that's going to help us lay the uh, foundation for going forward, a new generation of Earth observing and remote sensing missions, um, both because of the type of information it provides, but also the diversity of people that we're expecting to be able to use that information. So it is part of a future set of, of Earth observing satellites. Another um, area we're working towards is the Earth System Observatory, which is the next set of missions that will provide a more holistic um, picture of the Earth. In terms of um, accessibility of information, we're going to be reaching a, a new set of users with SWAT, and we're also working within NASA to provide that information and make it more accessible through things like the Earth Information Center. So just a little bit about SWAT before I hand it over to my other colleagues on this panel. So it is uh, about surface water and ocean. So it's on the surface waters, it'll provide the first global survey of water running through rivers and lakes. It'll help us understand where water is, where it's coming from, and where it's going. For oceans, it's going to allow us to observe ocean features with higher resolution. Oceans absorb a lot of carbon and heat, and this will give us a better understanding of that, those processes and help us improve both our understanding of the oceans as well as our projections into the future. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jasmine. Thank you so much, Kate, for getting us kicked off on our opening remarks. A lot of great background information there. Next, let's turn it over to Selma Churchali. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, I'm really delighted and uh, very pleased to be here with you today. As the Earth Observation Program Manager and the former SWAT program, this is with a deep emotion that we are merely now less than two days before the launch SWAT. And the SWAT launch today is really, is really timely correlated to the anniversary of more than three decades of excellent cooperation between NASA and CNES, marking the anniversary of the launch of the first Pathfinder mission called Topex Poseidon, dedicated to ocean altimetry mission. 
Since that time, the international cooperation has been extended to many other space agencies, operational ones, UMETSAT, NOAA, and the European Union Copernicus program has decided to implement a new generation of Copernicus Sentinel-6 Mike Freiglich, which, be, which has taken over Jason-3 as the new satellite altimetry reference missions. Could you please put the slides? If NASA and CNES have decided to make this mission happen, extended to UK Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency, it really thanks to their trust to collectively have the capability to handle such innovations and challenges. A few days ago, we were on the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite Plenary Meeting in France in Biarritz, where we had the opportunity to meet with the UK Space Agency leader, CSA leader, and NASA and CNES with the picture you have just in front of you. This is a great celebration marking this excellent cooperation and what a better present than the SWAT within this anniversary of 30 years of cooperation. Of course, within the global warming, there is a huge impact today we know on water cycle. Accelerating this water cycle by putting some drought in some parts of the world and floods in other parts. And we are reaching uh, our knowledge within the Earth cycle with some limits. And we know that many of the compartments of this water cycle to be understood. And that's why SWOT will be really a point finder mission providing new measurements, a new era, by having a global first global invent inventory of the surface water bodies by providing heights of the surface water, slopes, and delivering what we call the, the graal of hydrologists, which is discharge. And in the meantime, we will have also an important fine picture of uh, the stock water within uh, the lakes, reservoirs, and wetlands. We are speaking about uh, revolution in hydrology. But in the meantime, we will, for the first time, address a key processes within the ocean. Those key processes are totally unknown today. The scientists made an important hypothesis that with those fine scale processes, currents, eddies, filaments, SWOT will provide those measurements in order to understand those processes which play a critical role in the global circulation ocean and related to climate change. And this is really uh, important uh, provision from, uh, of course, the SWOT mission. Next slide, please. Since the beginning of the program and uh, the memorandum of understanding uh, which was signed between NASA and CNES, the science community was initially involved from the beginning. First of all, for establishing the science requirement. Then after, with the science definition uh, uh, team and the science team, they play a key role in order to refine those requirements and the specifications, taking into account the constraints from the technical point of view and budgetary ones. And the way that uh, we used to work closely between the projects and the science community was built through and over these three decades. And this is really a, an important aspect of the success of the past and current missions, and of course, of the upcoming one, the SWAT missions. And the next, next uh, slide, please. We had many, many meetings with the science team. And we now have more than 17 countries involved within the preparation of SWAT. Why 17 countries? Because, because with this uh, unprecedented measurement, new ones, we need to make calibration and validation of those measurements. And across the world, there are many teams already in starting block 
in order to check those measurements and to validate them. Next slide, please. NASA and CNES worked jointly to prepare the call towards the science community in order to decide to assess and to, of course, identify the key proposal that would make really advances in science and in the projects. And here you have uh, some of the meetings we had in France in 2015. Next, please. And the last one before the COVID crisis was held in Bordeaux in 2019 with the, one of the key NASA science program, Eric Lindstrom, who has now retired. And we have now Nadia next to me, who, who has become the, the new uh, ocean science program. Of course, beside the science perspective and the awaited advances uh, that is expected from SWOT mission, since the beginning, we initiated the SWOT early adopter programs. On French side, we called, we called that the SWOT downstream preparatory program. The aim of the program is to enlarge beyond the science community to all users around the world and, of course, uh, within the water agencies, within the, of course, uh, uh, navigation ag agencies, uh, many users, in order to allow them to prepare the handling those SWOT data within their permises and within their earth system in order to deliver operational services. We are speaking about prediction of floods, and we are waiting, of course, an important improvement of those uh, key models for prediction floats, but also for ocean circulation at the key scales. So we are really waiting all in a very exciting manner, this uh, marvelous and a uh, pathfinder SWOT mission and looking forward to the success of the SWOT launch. Thank you, Jasmine, back to you. Thank Alba, you. thank you so much. Uh, great opening remarks and also a good highlight to our international collaboration. Next, we're going to turn it over to Nadia Vinogradova Schiffer. Thank you, Jasmine, and uh, thank you, Selma. Reminding of uh, NASA CNES uh, strong altimetry marriage that going on a fourth decade. It's an open marriage. We're making new friends along the way with Canada and UK uh, with the SWAT. And as Selma already mentioned, SWAT is a Pathfinder mission. Uh, and what it means is that uh, there are many firsts with a SWAT uh, satellite mission. We're testing uh, new technology, new approaches uh, to measure earth water, height, volume, its dynamics. We are forging a new community of scientists and users. We are changing the culture, uh, the business of doing science, making uh, critical and complex Earth information more accessible, more inclusive, more actionable, uh, while still maintaining the highest standards of scientific integrity uh, of our information that both NASA and CNES are known for. So uh, with that many firsts and all eyes on SWAT, um, it's truly a pivotal moment for our space science industry. Uh, a moment that will define uh, future uh, standards in Earth observing, particularly um, uh, satellite altimetry, uh, in order to define, are we truly maximizing with this new technologies and new approaches, are we maximizing our uh, return uh, on investments, our scientific and societal uh, return on investments, and observing and predicting Earth water is a worthy investment as we as humanity uh, depend on uh, earth water to survive and uh, prosper. Um, let's just take a quick look at how water moves, a little bit earth science one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you don't mind, just uh, the first image. What we're looking here is the precipital water and how the water moves from ocean to land. We know that uh, oceans is the ultimate source of all moisture and water on Earth. Think of oceans, those huge warehouses uh, that supply moisture and water fro uh, to land that we rely in as our drinking water, agriculture and industry. And this SWOT uh, global look 
uh, on both ocean and land water. It gives you truly look at the supply and demand chain in order for us to truly look at the earth water as a holistic process. And that enables a better predictive capability if you truly observe the supply demand, ch uh, demand chain. Just think of it as if you come to your local grocery store and you want to buy some fruits or vegetables <coughs> and the shelves are empty. Right? I mean, at that point, it's kind of too late to prepare. Uh, but if you have information that your uh, farmer, your supplier of your produce experience some disruption, either shortage or excessive supply, then you have more time to prepare those disruption in it when you come to the local uh, grocery store. So the same with earth water. If you want to uh, prepare for the upcoming flood or, or a deficit of land water, <coughs> uh, you do look at your supply, your farmer, the ocean where the, uh, where the moisture originates. Um, so that's, of course, a unique aspect of the mission and uh, a, a welcome one. Another uh, breakthrough with the SWOT technology, of course, is that we're going to look at earth water um, at a very <coughs> high resolution and clarity like never before. I call it a SWOT goggles. So it's a 10x improvement in clarity and resolution of, uh, of earth water. Uh, let's see what it means for the ocean, if you don't mind, uh, on, the next, uh, on the next animation. What we're looking here is uh, um, ocean movement. Ocean movement, uh, the red colors represent warmer oceans and the blue colors are cooler oceans. And what we see here is essentially that uh, ocean is a turbulent flow and uh, uh, ocean turbulence and 80s are constantly on the move and they are busy and effective engines transporting uh, a large amount of uh, kinetic energy, heat, mass, salt, nutrients, carbon, plastic, pollution, you name it. So this constant movement uh, of, uh, that is initiated by, by those uh, active uh, players in the climate system are what keeps our Earth system uh, functioning or uh, dysfunctioning, uh, as, as we already see in our measurements. So when we are um, in the business of making better prediction of the Earth system, of the global warming, we, uh, we rely on the ocean to take it for the team, Team Earth, and absorb most of the global ocean, uh, o global warming within the ocean. And that, think about it, that m um, half of the vertical transport of this heat absorption from the surface to the deep ocean is done by turbulence, half. So turbulence matters. Perhaps a turbulence is that missing climate uh, puzzle piece that we've never observed. And that would help us solve this climate prediction better. Enter SWAT a very timely entrance, an entrance as we look at our changing water on planet Earth just in front of our eyes. So we're ready for you, SWAT. You can go SWAT, yeah? Very excited. Back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Nadia. I love your energy. Yes, we are very excited for SWAT. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Tamlin Pavelski. All right, thanks so much, Jasmine. So as you've heard from some of our other speakers, um, we're really going to see this, uh, this, this big new capability with SWAT to see our rivers and lakes in high definition. And that's, that's immensely exciting. So right now with satellite imagery, um, we can see pretty well where rivers and lakes are located, right? We can see their area pretty well. But we don't do nearly so well in terms of our ability to see the height of the water in them. And uh, uh, really the, the key advance for SWAT in terms, of, in terms of surface water hydrology is that we're going to be able to simultaneously measure the extent of water and the height of water. And adding that new dimension is critical because it allows us to, to think about things in terms of volumes and changes in volumes over time, right? So all of us learned about the water cycle at some point in elementary school or middle school. And uh, you know, we heard a little bit about it from Nadia already, thinking about the transport of moisture from oceans uh, via the atmosphere onto the land surface. And for the entire water cycle, if we really want to understand it in, in ways that are important for us, we need to be able to think about it not just conceptually, but in terms of volumes, how much water is there and how is it flowing from place to place. And 
SWAT is going to allow us to do that. For, for lakes, we'll be able to see how the volume of lakes and reservoirs increases and decreases over time. And for rivers, we're going to be able to see how uh, essentially we'll be able to track the volume of water flowing through rivers from space, which is, which is just really exciting and, and uh, frankly pretty unprecedented. So what are we actually going to see with SWAT? Let's get, get, get down to brass tacks here. Um, for lakes, we expect to see uh, lakes larger than about 15 acres, so that's 250 meters by 250 meters. And we expect to see almost all of the world's rivers wider than about 330 feet, or about 100 meters. So let's take each one of these individually, and let's start with lakes. Could I have my first uh, slide, please? So right now, if I went out and wanted to get data on changes in water level or volume in uh, some, of, uh, some of the Earth's lakes, I could probably get pretty good on the ground data for maybe a few thousand of them um, scattered over the world. SWAT is going to observe millions of lakes. So we're going up by orders of magnitude in, our, in terms of our capability to track water through lakes and reservoirs. And this matters a lot, whether you're thinking about uh, a really ecologically vulnerable lake, like the mountain uh, lake that, I, that uh, we have up here in this image, or if you're uh, thinking about a reservoir in a rural part of India where people depend on that water for irrigating their crops. SWAT is going to pr provide the free and open data that everyone needs in order to be able to track these really important resources. OK, so what about rivers? Uh, could I have uh, the next image, please? So what you're looking at here is a map of all of the rivers that we plan to observe with SWAT. There's about 2.1 million kilometers of rivers worldwide. And um, for, for all of these rivers, you know, we, we, uh, we plan to uh, be able to observe that volume of water uh, moving down them, which is, which is uh, really impressive. So right now, when we, when we try to observe uh, rivers around the world, we use a network of, of, of sort of on-the-ground gauges. And those gauges are uh, expensive to maintain and install, and they're very unevenly distributed around the world. Um, now, they can do things that SWAT can't, right? Like they can provide data every 15 minutes, which is great. But SWAT can also do some things that they can't. So for example, SWAT will observe the entire length of a river rather than just what's going on at a single point, which is really cool and, uh, and, and, and really different. Um, so let's look at one specific example here of, of, of where SWAT might, might make a difference for rivers. Could, I, could we have the next image, please? So what we're looking at here are the rivers that we expect SWAT to observe in the Congo River Basin. So the Congo, it's the second largest river in the world. Uh, about 75 million people live in the Congo River Basin. And yet, we actually have good on-the-ground observations of, uh, of, of flow through the Congo River at a handful of places in this entire area. And with SWAT, we're going to be able to observe all of the rivers that you see uh, up on the screen here. And it's going to really help us do a better job of serving people who live in this basin. And that's particularly important because the UN has identified the Congo Basin as, as a, a, a basin that's particularly vulnerable to uh, the impacts of climate change. So if we put all of this together, SWAT is really going to uh, allow us to understand sort of how water volume changes in our rivers and lakes um, worldwide. And that's a, a new and exciting thing. So I've been working for, for the last 20 years or more on uh, trying to use satellite data to understand Earth's uh, surface water. And we're constantly having to come up with ways of using data from satellites that weren't designed for what we want to do, right? We're repurposing other people's data. And we've been able to do cool things with that. But SWAT is the first satellite that's specifically designed to study rivers and lakes. And it's going to be a real game changer. I'm so excited about it. Back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Tamlin. We really appreciate you shedding light on so many different bodies of water. Uh, we have one more panelist to hear from. You've been waiting very patiently, so let's t throw it over to uh, Benjamin Hamlington. Thanks, Jasmine, and thanks to the other speakers. So I, I want to focus in a little bit more on some of the societal benefits and applications of the SWAT data. We've heard that SWAT is going to provide measurements of nearly all surface water here on Earth. Um, we're going to have measurements over the land, over the ocean, but also where land and ocean meet in this coastal interface, which is really critical. So many people around the world live along our coastlines. Um, so SWAT's going to provide really relevant information for 
all these communities, all these people living in these different places and allow us to make measurements that will ultimately improve our, our lives and livelihoods. So I want to walk through some of these examples, um, starting with the land first. So as Tamlin and others have said, SWAT is going to give us this really new look at the lakes, rivers, and reservoirs across the globe. So on these global scales, we're going to be able to see things that we just could not see before. We're going to be able to track the movement of water around the, the earth between ocean and land, be able to make some of these connections and really understand where water is at any given time. Um, so this is really critical because we know with climate change that the earth's water cycle is accelerating. What this means is that some locations have too much water, others don't have enough. We're seeing more extreme droughts, more extreme floods. Uh, precipitation patterns are changing, are changing, becoming more volatile. So it's really important that we try to understand exactly what is happening um, using this SWOT data. So if we can pull up the first visual. Um, so in this visual, we're showing uh, the Connecticut River, which flows through several states in the Northeast uh, United States. Um, SWAT is flying over with its SWAT measurement, measuring the, the full extent of this river as, as SWAT, as a, uh, excuse me, as Tamlin referred to. These red um, colors here are higher, higher water levels, so SWAT is measuring water levels, not just the extent of uh, the river as it changes over time. But SWAT's going to continue to make these measurements, track the changes that are occurring in rivers like the Connecticut River, and provide very important information for those that rely upon it. So what does this mean? So with the SWAT data, we can give really important information to a, a wide variety of stakeholders. Really anyone that cares about water should be, should be concerned about what SWAT's going to provide. We have water resource manager, uh, managers. We have um, uh, emergency preparedness agencies, civil engineers. Uh, for those of you at home who are maybe concerned about uh, access to water or flooding and drought, we'll be able to better predict those, the occurrences of those things with the SWAT data. So it's really going to provide rich information that impacts all of us. Um, and really importantly, it's going to measure these on global scales, right? So in the U.S., maybe there's some areas that we monitor really well with in situ observations. Uh, but on global scales, uh, some of these rivers, lakes are very difficult to measure. SWAT's going to provide um, a solution to that. We'll be able to see those changes that are occurring on global scales, not just in specific locations. So shifting gears a little bit, focusing on the coastlines. So we know sea level is rising. Climate change is causing sea levels along the world's coastlines to go up. We know from other NASA satellites that the rate at which sea level is increasing is increasing itself. We can have our, our foot on the gas pedal in terms of the sea level rise that we're seeing. The impacts that are associated with the sea level rise are also expanding. They're worsening in severity. The impacts are getting worse. Here in California, where we are today, we see coastal erosion that's happening because of higher sea levels. Um, in other parts of the country, of the U.S., we see greater storm surge associated with hurricanes. And all along the world's coastlines, we're seeing these impacts increase, flooding start to increase, and populations become threatened by sea level. Now, it may be surprising, but in some of uh, these locations around the world, we really don't have a good understanding of what's happening at the coast. So the satellites we have now don't get us right up to the coast, a little bit offshore. We have tide gauge measurements, which are directly at the coast, but they're very sparse across the world's coastlines. There's big gaps between them. So again, it may be surprising, but we just don't know what's happening with coastal sea levels in a lot of these locations around the world. If we can pull up my, our, our next animation. The reason it's so important to understand these changes is because there's pretty fine scale sea level changes that are occurring in these coastal areas. This here is an image of the Mississippi Delta region. Um, you can see SWAT flying over the ocean, through that coastal interface, and onto land. And it's going to provide rich information across all these different components of the, that coastal zone. So we'll, we're going to be able to provide this information to those that need it most, these coastal communities that are already planning for and adapting to the sea level rise and coastal impacts that are occurring. There's a wide range of stakeholders uh, that, that are impacted by uh, sea level rise. Um, national security is an issue, certainly, that, uh, that comes up. Our military has a lot of infrastructure in these coastal regions. Being able to provide this information to the military and other coastal communities will allow them to better plan for what's happening and account for those changes going forward into the future. So what is being done to ensure this data is actually useful? How are we, what are we doing to make sure that this data can be used in all these different applications? So there's a couple things. So SWAT has this concept of open science. So we're making the data associated with SWAT available, publicly available. That's, that's certainly important. But beyond that, we're also building tools to help people work with the data once it becomes available. Right? So we're not just providing the data, but in, uh, encouraging people to use it, interact with it, and start to um, implement it within their applications. Additionally, we have something called the Early Adopters Program, which you've already heard about. It's an international program with uh, 
early adopters, these different uh, people who are working um, in, say, water resource management, uh, working on the oceans, different applications. They come in and work with the SWAT team to really understand how to implement the SWAT data once it becomes available. It's an international uh, team of these early adopters. We actually have a couple early adopters here that are going to be at launch with us tomorrow, one from India, one from, from Germany. So it's a really global scale effort to ensure that the SWAT data is ultimately useful. So just to wrap up, the SWAT data, it's, it's going to measure surface water everywhere, right? We're going to have measurements both over land, over the ocean, but also that coastal interface. And it's going to provide such important information. It's going to be transformative in our ability to provide information that will ultimately improve the daily lives and livelihoods of almost everyone here on Earth. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jasmine. Benjamin, and thank you to all of our panelists for those opening remarks. A great job from all of you. Now we're going to transition into the question and answer portion of today's briefing. For media here in the phone, we do have a microphone to pass you, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, please just raise your hand and then you can state your name, your affiliation, and who you would like to answer your question. For media on the phone, please, uh, please press star one if you would like to enter the question queue. And if you're joining us online, feel free to use hashtag AskNASA to uh, ask a question here. And with that being said, uh, we'll start in the room here with media. And if none uh, would like to ask a question yet, we will go to our uh, social media friends online. The first question is from Instagram. Is there any kind of new tech that is being tested through SWAT? New technology. Karen? Yep. Would you like to? I'll, I'll, I'll start and then pass it to Salma. Yes, uh, as, as one of the NASA's uh, and CNES uh, firsts, we're testing a new uh, technology, which is a radar interferometer that operates at a Ka band portion of electromagnetic spectrum. We call it Karen. Uh, and this is a first in-flight demonstration for this new technologies to measure uh, elevation of ocean and inland waters. Answered it perfectly now. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <Yes. laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go to social media again. Uh, how much more detail will we be able to see with SWAT than with current satellites or observation techniques, and why does that matter? So I. Uh, I'm happy to talk especially about uh, what's what's happening on 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 land, right? So. Um, Let's start by thinking about lakes, right? We have uh, lakes uh, dotting the world all over the place, right? And mostly we don't have an idea of what's going on in terms of uh, how their water levels or the amount of water that, that uh, is stored in them varies. And you can kind of think about each one of those lakes as like a little gauge that measures the water cycle, right? How much precipitation, how much evaporation, you know, what's going on with the water cycle in that area? And so right now we have this, this sort of big blank canvas where mostly we're not using um, that information to understand our world. And once we have SWAT um, up there, we're going to be able to, to, to see that everywhere. And it's going to give us this much better picture of what's going on with the water cycle as a whole and with our water resources, right? How much water do we have available to irrigate our crops, to drink when we turn on the tap um, for our ecosystems? So from a land perspective, that sort of extra resolution is going to be really critical. Um, maybe I'll pass it to Ben to talk a little bit about the ocean. Or did someone, do you want to handle the ocean? No, for, for the, uh, just to perhaps to complement uh, Tamlin's uh, answer on the detail, the question related to the detail, I think uh, we have to um, notice that it's the first time that so, so finest measurement will be provided. As uh, Tamling explained during his intervention, we will have lakes with uh, um, what we called uh, spatial resolution, 250 meter per 250 meter. We have never provided such measurement before the SWAT mission. Uh, for the rivers, it's the same. Uh, the requirement is uh, to reach uh, all the river wider than 100 a meter of the resolution with the goal of 50 meters. And uh, there, was, there was really a huge preparatory work in order to prepare those database and to check if really SWOT measurement will cover all those rivers and lakes. And this is really a revolution 
uh, as Tamlin mentioned, it is really the first mission dedicated to hydrology purpose. Mm -hmm. For Ocean, um, regarding the long history and the current Nadir Altimeter mission, we are with SWOT uh, really making a breakthrough also for Ocean because we are aiming to provide fine scale observation 10 times better than the current technology, which is a really, uh, again, uh, a first, what we called in French, a world premiere. Uh, so uh, hopefully I, I, uh, I uh, respond to your question. Thank you. I can add just a, maybe a little more detail on the coastal region as well. So I work a lot with communities, coastal communities trying to prepare for sea level, provide them sea level projections to plan for the future. And the, the question always comes up, but what's happening where I am? Like what? right where I am here in this bay and this very local area, what's happening here? And with the satellites we have now and the tide gauges, like I said, we really don't have great information there, but uh, with SWAT, we're gonna be able to get that, fill in those gaps, fill in those blind spots that we have now and really start to refine our understanding of the sea level change that's happening in these coastal areas. So um, that uh, finer resolution information that Tamlin and someone talked about, it certainly extends into these coastal regions as well, which is gonna be really important. Thank you guys for teaming up to answer that question. We do have somebody on the phone, uh, Ash Santang from Launchpad News. Thanks for having me on. Question for the panel. How has the international collaboration helped um, the SWAT mission receive a greater reach into hydrology and oceanography research? And which of the scientific instruments or critical hardware has been provided by each of the international partners? Thank you. Uh, would you guys like to start in the middle or do you need, do you need it repeated? Yes, please, if you could repeat it. Uh, Ash, would you be able to repeat your question? How has international collaboration helped the SWAT mission achieve a greater reach into hydrology and oceanography research? And which scientific instruments or critical hardware has been provided by each of the international partners? Thank you. Yes, it, as what as Selma already outlined, it's a truly collaborative uh, endeavor. Uh, we have uh, worked on it for about 20 years or so and uh, um, truly leaned on each other. Uh, and uh, this uh, collaborative, this team spirit uh, took us through multiple global crises over the past few years, from a health crisis to political turmoils to to, uh, uh, to you name it, to environmental uh, crises. And so uh, this uh, uh, international spirit, as, uh, as I call it, like, like a World Cup kind of uh, endeavor that's really helped us to, um, to move through uh, a major milestone. And uh, in terms of um, uh, engineering a collaboration, it was a, um, a, a collaborative effort as well with both uh, NASA and CNES providing a key component and testing both in France and the U.S. and the observatory being uh, ping pong back and forth between two continents. So it, it, it was a, we took collaboration on a new level, don't you think, Salma? Yeah, I completely agree, of course. And uh, regarding the question related to how we supported also the research community uh, on both sides, uh, from the beginning we had always a joint call, a call towards the, the science community, uh, we jointly assessed uh, the French proposal, the U.S. proposals. Uh, CNES was in charge also to uh, assess and to select the international uh, ones. And today this uh, collective and joint effort allow us to involve not only the four space agencies uh, who are collaborating to develop the space segment, but more, more important, 17 countries are already involved in the preparation to handle those measurements and to calibrate them and validate them. A uh, few days ago, uh, I, I was uh, chairing the uh, CIOS plenary meeting, and when we had the, from Nadia and Rosemary Moreau, who is the French Ocean uh, PI, principal investigator of the mission, uh, I was really uh, very pleased to see that more than countries already involved are also have the willingness to, to join this international club in order to provide also their expertise, but also to benefit from those uh, open data uh, from uh, the SWOT mission. So this is really a, a truly uh, cooperative uh, mission, of course, uh, beyond NASA, CNES, CSA, and UKSA. Thank you. Elma, Nadia, thank you so much for uh, answering that question together. Uh, I believe we'll toss it back to social media. 
And this question's for Kate. Kate, climate change is complex. How does knowing more about ocean circulation help us better understand climate change? And then how does that understanding impact our options on how to move forward? Thank you for the question. So oceans play a really important role in climate change. They absorb a lot of the heat as well as a lot of the carbon. So when we um, put carbon dioxide emissions into the, when we burn them through fossil fuels or other changes on the Earth's surface, some of that carbon goes into the ocean, some goes onto land, uh, absorbed by trees, others um, stays in the atmosphere. And how much the, and how the ocean circulates influences how much more carbon we can uptake. And there are similar processes related to heat. So as it gets warmer, the oceans are absorbing a lot of that heat. So better understanding that mixing process of the ocean will help us understand how much more heat and carbon we can uptake. And that's really important for understanding future climate change and how activities by humans influence future climate change. Kate, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, seeing none in the room yet, again, we will go back to social media. Thank you. And this one's from Russell on YouTube asks, will SWAT be able to see through forest canopy and vegetation for wetland water levels? This is a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, w th there are a handful of questions that I am really excited to see what happens when SWAT launches. Because I don't think we fully know the answer. and. A lot of that is because wetlands are so complex, right? That term contains a vast array of different environments from places like the Everglades, where you might have, you know, grass, you know, grasses with water underneath, to places like the Amazon floodplain, where you have really dense forest canopies. If I had to guess, I would guess that SWAT might be able to tell us some really interesting things about what's going on in those sort of more grassland type areas or places where you have a little bit sparser vegetation. I think just because the wavelength that we're using is so short, um, it may be a little bit difficult for us to get really good data in places where we have really dense vegetation. But this really goes back to a lot of what uh, Nadia was talking about, right? SWAT is a pathfinder mission. And what that means is that when we put it up in space, we don't know all of its capabilities, right? And part of the joy of working on SWAT is getting to find out. Thank you so much. Oh, did you, would you like to add, Selma? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, just um, another um, perhaps insight on this important question. Uh, within the uh, early adopter programs and within the SWAT preparatory program, from the beginning, uh, we are not considering SWOT as a standalone mission to address these key complex climate change questions and issues. And from the beginning, of course, within the CNES uh, Earth Observation Program, uh, also for NASA Earth Observation Program, we are considering the, the use of the SWOT measurement in conjunction with and complementary with other key observations in order to tackle those key questions in terms of what we call the physical measurements. And we have already uh, today in orbit uh, some uh, European missions, such as a SMOS or SMAP on NASA JPL mission. Uh, from the beginning, they, are not, uh, they were not expected to provide, for example, the, 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 um, the height of vegetation over tropical region. They were dedicated to other science objectives. But uh, when we explore those new measurements, we uh, could develop uh, other uh, key uh, areas that were not completely expected from the initial missions. So my main message here is to say that SWOT measurement, yes, is a new, is a, an unprecedented measurement, but in the meantime, all the science community and all the users that we, we spoke about uh, in the early adopter programs are preparing that in conjunction, in complementary with other measurements, but more important. More important tackling the complex climate change is also preparing the new generation of climate change modeling. Uh, we are speaking uh, uh, in France within the Copernicus Marine Service and Marcator. Since 2013, we are preparing the next high resolution model which could assimilate and will assimilate those SWOT measurements in order to uh, provide a better prediction, more than better seven days. And this is the critical aspect also of the SWOT program, is to handle and to gather all the means, all the assets, in order to make the better added value of those SWOT measurements. 
Selma, thank you so much for that addition there. Uh, we do have another phone in question. This is Lucy Odor with ASP. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the scientific instruments on board? Uh, what are they exactly? Are they cameras, radars? Um, why these big two arms uh, for the satellite? And, and yeah, how do these instruments compare with previous ones? Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the heart of the SWAT system is the new radar interferometer, which we call uh, Karen, as I explained already. Uh, there are two antennas, and uh, one of them is transmits an electromagnetic pulse, which bounces off uh, the Earth's surface, being uh, uh, captured by both antennas. And uh, the signals are a little bit out of sync, out of phase, what we call it. Uh, and that this phase difference uh, combined uh, with uh, radar wavelength allows us uh, to uh, triangulate and compute the distance between the Earth's uh, surface and the satellite, which we then translate to the height of the water. So, um, and we're doing it uh, over this wide swath, like with two antennas doing it over the wide swath. I think uh, Ben had a nice animation with a swath following, so over like, 50 kilometers wide, so this is our first uh, two-dimensional measurements of sea surface height or, or ocean height, right? Or water height, rather. Uh, <laughs> still, you know, ocean physicist, yes. So water height, um, and that's and that sets it apart from the traditional, uh, just downward-looking nadir altimeter, as what Sandra um, Selma referring earlier, that just look down and uh, collect measurements uh, of the water surface in a traditional, conventional way. We will have this nadir uh, technology on a SWAT as well to complement uh, Karen, white swath, SWAT, SWAT technology also, but so, so complementarity is another aspect of the SWAT um, observing system. Did I answer, uh, was it a two-part question or, or, or that's enough? I know that that was good. That was um, on the instruments, I believe, okay. so I think you covered right. it. <laughs> just, just a few mistakes, and I edited it, but all right, we'll, we'll roll with that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, I think we have time for about uh, two or three more questions, so I will check back in with social media. Another question from YouTube. Will moisture in the air affect the measurements? Yes, and we have an app for it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, not yes. yes. Okay. Yes. The answer is yes, of course. Yes. And, uh, and we have already uh, some, um, what we call the, within the, um, the classical Nadir altimetry mission, and it is the case for the SWOT. Uh, we will have what we could have a geophysical product that could benefit from those correction needed correction from the atmosphere atmosphere uh, impact uh, on the measurement of course the atmospheric troposphere etc etc of course very good. Thank you, uh, Nadia and Selma, again for answering that together. Uh, again, I'm looking around the room, but if none, uh, no other are in the room, we'll go back to social media once more. And this is the last one from social. Uh, when are you expecting the data to be available to the public, and how will they access it? Perhaps so. I can take it. Yes. So, so as we were saying, uh, with SWOT, we are uh, building an open science uh, community, what we call it. So we're trying this experiment where we are releasing so-called pre-validated data sets and uh, kind of inviting community uh, to help uh, NASA and CNES validate this new uh, measurement uh, together. So all hands on deck, and we're releasing this product uh, in the approximately nominal time frame for uh, 2023. Yeah, this is an important uh, rendezvous, uh, <laughs> I, I would like to, to, to say with the community. Uh, today, uh, all the data uh, are aiming to be available by September 2023. But uh, prior to this important milestone, uh, there, are, there are many teams uh, around the world to, to handle and to investigate those, uh, those new measurements. This is really critical. And uh, as I have the, the opportunity to speak about that, and um, at European level, we have also an important rendezvous with those uh, CALVAL measurements, SWOT measurements, uh, because we are preparing the next generation of Copernicus uh, Sentinel topography mission. And uh, of course, this new technology, as Nadia mentioned, uh, is opening uh, 
uh, a new era, but in the meantime, uh, a continuity. Continuity, as Nadir is on board yeah. this mission, but also uh, opportunities on uh, new areas uh, in climate uh, in climate change uh, studies. And uh, we have uh, within the European Space Agency and the European Union an important rendezvous uh, in the uh, um, beginning of 2024 after uh, the, the reception of the calibrated and validated SWOT measurement. This is a really uh, important rendezvous. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was all the time we had for, for questions today, but you all did a fantastic job. I want to thank our panelists for joining us. Also, thank you to those of you who asked questions. Uh, we invite you to join us again right here on NASA TV for the pre-launch briefing that will be at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And you can tune in as well to watch the launch broadcast that is this Thursday, December 15th, with live coverage on NASA TV or nasa.gov forward slash live, and that will begin at 3 a.m. Pacific. Uh, for more information on SWAT science, you can go to swat.jpl.nasa.gov. And you can also follow along with the mission at blogs.nasa.gov forward slash SWAT. We thank you all again here in the room and to our panelists for joining us today. And until next time, go SWAT. Go SWAT. Go SWAT. <laughs> go SWAT.